thankful for the refreshing that I feel in this moment. If you would join me in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to continue our study this evening. We've been talking about the whole armor of God. And we've taken the last two sessions from Ephesians chapter 6. And we'll be reading Ephesians 6, 13 through 15. The epistle says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul said, have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so tonight we're going to continue that study in the whole armor of God, and we're going to talk about just that, the gospel of peace. Can we pray and let's ask the Lord together to have his way. Lord Jesus, we love you. And God, we understand that we are but frail flesh. We are unable to accomplish anything on our own here tonight. And God, your spirit is already evident in this place, and we are thankful for it. And so now we're asking you, Lord, that your word would be spoken. God, not because of who stands here, but because it's your word, and we need it, and we stand upon it, and we thank you for it, and we'll give you praise in advance. In Jesus' name, you can be seated tonight. Thank you for standing. Thank you for your worship. To say we live in tumultuous times would, it goes without saying, but it would be an understatement. For decades, at least in the country that we live, we have lived in constant turmoil. Now, maybe not necessarily always every day in our lives, but as a nation, as a whole, we we have seen turmoil, constant seasons of turmoil. Now, there have been certainly seasons in this country, or at least in the world, of less agitating times. But for the most part, the fact of the matter is, is that we are in the perilous times that Paul said we would end up in. So there's protests, there's demonstrations that escalate into riotous pandemonium, epidemics and pandemics, overturned markets, rising prices, diving stocks, uncertainty and misunderstandings, egregious misrepresentations of the truth, political dissidents, distrust, and disgrace. And if someone were to walk in at this very moment in the middle of all of those things that have just been said, it would perhaps bring to mind if some lawless state or some lawless government, some sort of third world country, if you will. But the fact of the matter is, is that these things are occurring right here in our own backyard. And so if we just were to think back just two years ago, just two years doesn't seem that long, but at the same time, it seems like it was just yesterday. It's 2022, but if we were to think back to 2020, we probably saw one of the most trying times in our, at least our generation. Now, certainly there's been things that have happened in this world and in this country before, but for us, 2020 was a trying time. It was an especially trying summer. It's not a brand new concept. It wasn't something that was made up then. It wasn't a new response to a some perceived issue, but the phrase was said over and over again, perhaps you remember it, no justice, no peace. It became a a common phrase, a common theme among those who would demonstrate or who would protest injustice. It was a warning of sorts. It was A warning to those in authority that if the desired results of whatever was being challenged did not occur, that the the unrest would just continue and the result would be the antithesis of peace. No peace. To fight fire 
with fire. But not only that, if we were to really be honest with ourselves, the world was faced at the same time with a novel epidemic that then turned into this global pandemic. Now, no matter what we might think or what side we might be on that, the fact of the matter is, is that it did occur. It did occur in conjunction with all of this unrest, further complicating many of the chaotic scenes that we saw all across this country, layer upon layer, compound upon compound, a concophony of sorts of confusion and unrest that simply has not ceased. It's something on the lower surface. It's not gone away. It's, it's, you can feel it bubbling underneath. It's not done. The, 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 the contest is not over and so with every day that passes, it would, have, it would appear that these things would become more prevalent or not decreasing, but they are increasing, more prevalent, and more likely to occur in our lifetime, no pun intended, with every step that we take. You see, if this world, and I believe this with all of my heart, if this world were ever in need of anything... It is in need of preachers of the gospel of peace. And I'll go one step further than that. If the people of God ever needed anything in this hour, it is to be reminded of who they are and for which cause they have been called. If the people of this world ever needed anything, it would be people that would awaken to who they are and who they are in God and become what God has called them to be. And so we are called, each and every one of us in this building here tonight. I believe that we are called, and we are called to live out a journey and to walk out a life in a fallen world, not a perfect world. By any stretch of the imagination, the curse of sin began with a very simple choice. And I understand I'm in company tonight who has far surpassed my ability to, to speak on this matter, but let's just be reminded. It began with a simple choice. A question was posed and mankind chose the alternative of a peaceful existence. The garden that Adam was husbandman to, the dominion that God had given to him was traded for a momentary indulgence, a chance, a, an ignorance or an ignorance of a law and a command and a gamble that proved to be spiritually fatal. And that catastrophic fallout that occurred from that one encounter would produce horrific consequences and thrust mankind into a perpetual Conflict, And so that is why we find ourselves in the perilous times. And that is why we find ourselves here tonight, whether we want to admit it or not. We are in the middle of a spiritual battleground. We are in the middle of a spiritual war that is warring right now for our minds, for our attention, for our families, for our friends, for our co-workers, we are in the middle of that battleground. It isn't a battleground that's made up of material weapons. It's not literal soldiers that are marching towards an intended target. It's not a series of skirmishes that are made up by tangible assets like planes and tanks and bombs and guns or rifles or knives or hand grenades. There is physical wars, yes. Jesus said that they would occur. He said that there would be rumors of wars and wars and nations that rise against nations, ethnicities against ethnicities. He said it would happen and it is happening. But what we are really facing is not physical war itself. It's the core of all of that. It is the core that, that causes all of these things to take place. Not a physical battle at all and not even against people, although some might be able to argue that point. It is not against people. This war does not, does not consist of some conquered physical soul, but this battle is, is, is a conflict in sin, and its driving force is sin, and its originality is within. I don't believe this. I don't believe that the devil made me do it. 
I don't believe that. There was a man of Gadara that a legion of devils couldn't keep him from getting to the feet of Jesus. So I don't believe that the devil can make you do anything. I believe that it all begins with a choice. And so, yes, we have a spiritual enemy. Yes, we have an enemy who is warring against us. And quite frankly, he uses people to do that. He uses the flesh. He consumes it. He works through it. But the originality is choice. And so if he doesn't have anybody to make the wrong choice, then there would be no battle. But there is. And the Bible says, Paul even said, that he is a crafty and cunning adversary. And one of his most usual tactics is disturbing the peace. Keeping something stirred. Keeping something always in a state of confusion. And with that, his attacks are constant. With that, his strategy is consistent. It doesn't stop. It is always there. But his plan can only come to pass when we enter into choice. And so for this cause, Paul said, we have the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6, chapter 11, or chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, Paul outlines the armor. Brother Larry began this study by talking to us about the girdle of truth. Pastor, a week later, talked about the breastplate of righteousness. And so tonight, we will center our study around the gospel of peace, or specifically the shoes that are involved with the gospel of peace. Now, it seems, quite frankly to me, if we look at this from a humanistic standpoint, it seems as though it would be a counterintuitive discussion to talk about peace and war at the same time. It's, it's, it seems counterintuitive to talk about peace when we're actively listening or reading Paul's words that admonish the Ephesians to put on armor, equipping them for battle. Peace and war don't seem to go together. It seems to be some sort of conflict of concepts They don't actively work in tandem. Now, some of Paul's writings, hopefully I'm not the only one that would admit this, some of Paul's writings are sometimes difficult to understand. Even the Apostle Peter alluded to that fact. And so I believe that that is for a reason. I believe that it's for a purpose. I believe that the Apostle Paul's reasoning in some of the complexity of which he spoke causes us, or at least it should, to dig in just a little bit deeper to uncover or ponder or consider the matter. And so hopefully by the end of this study, we will have done that. It's already been mentioned in previous statements, but it's very important to understand again the context of where Paul is coming up with this concept. It's very important to understand that Paul is not writing this from some desk in an air-conditioned room with a fan. He's not Ernest Hemingway. He's not writing the great American novel. Paul is writing this from a cell in a Roman prison. And so the apostle is not a novice when it comes to conflict. The, the, the man who, who spent nights shipwrecked, the man who spent time beaten and hungry and tired And destitute is no stranger to the physical and very real spiritual struggle of being a good soldier in the army of the Lord. And so he's writing this from a place that is not comfortable. He's writing this in a place that is absolutely full of confusion and conflict. And he's writing to a people that is in one of the most superstitious, one of the most pagan cultures of their day. It is saturated with it. Does that sound familiar? So the man who has spent night shipwrecked, hungry, beaten, he's writing to a group of people or a group of churches throughout Asia Minor, the Ephesians, and he's writing to one of the most deeply superstitious and pagan cultures of their day. And so he reminds them. He reminds them first and outlines their role as a church. He reminds them of their call. He reminds them of their conversion. He reminds them that they are called out of their old life 
and into the new. And then he reminds them of the mission. And then he moves into exhortation. He instructs them in intercessory prayer. He calls them to spiritual unity, to moral conduct, and then he exhorts unto them in reference to spiritual battle. Now, Paul was not some sort of arbitrary guy. He didn't just come up with stuff off the cuff. He was very intentional in his writings. He knew his audience, and he knew from where he sat, from where he wrote the letter. And so Ephesians, because of who he's writing to, is one of the most extensive instructions or outlines of the role of the church in the spiritual realm. It was the church that Paul wrote to, because it was the church that Paul believed in. If you read his writings and you spend any time in the epistles that he wrote, we will find quickly that it was obvious that Paul thought very highly of the church at large. He believed in the church. He believed that it was a blood-bought church. He believed that it was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ and he understood that it was not created so that it could serve as a social club or a retirement center. He understood that it was not given birth to just to become some private organization with the goal of exclusivity and membership. He understood and full well knew that the church was not destined to begin in victory and then end in defeat. The church is it always will be the church of the living God Paul understood and he stood behind the fact that the church hear me now will prevail no matter what Paul understood that the church and he admonished them that the church is the most powerful spiritual entity in the earth I'm going to say that again because it doesn't feel like maybe we all understand it. The church, what you're a part of right now, what we are doing in this house right now, we are a part of the most powerful spiritual entity in the earth. What we are doing here right now is not just marking time or trying to figure out something to do to take up time so that we can not not stay at home and watch TV. That's not what we're doing here tonight. But what we are doing right here and right now rises in the face of every principality in this earth. What we are doing right here and right now on this Wednesday night is standing in opposition to every evil power. Hear me now, what we are doing here right now is pushing back against every ruler of every sort of darkness in this earth. And what we are doing here right now is serving witness and notice to every spiritual wickedness in this world that their dominion has been broken. What we are doing here right now is telling the evil one. It is telling every ruler of every spiritual darkness that you are not in charge. You are not going to prevail. You are beaten. You are defeated. And the church is forever triumphant. It's the church that's mighty in battle. It's the church that is victorious that the gates of hell have no chance of prevailing against. It is the church, the bride of Christ, the model of reconciliation and peace that is to come in this coming age. However, the church, even though it is destined for greatness, Even though the church is destined for eternal greatness, it's made up of frail flesh. The church is destined. It is the only thing that is predestined for greatness. The church is going up. It's not going down. But it's made up of frail flesh. It's not made up of superhumans. 
It's not some sort of genetically modified experiment. It's made up of earthen vessels and earthen vessels that must protect themselves. And so in this final admonition, Paul outlines the armor and references our specific study here tonight, the gospel of peace, the shoes that we must wear. And so in a modern sense, in our day and time, if we were to think about a soldier's modern uniform, our minds, our eyes would probably be drawn to the actual dress, <clears throat> battle top, battle uniform, BDUs, that's what we call them, battle dress uniforms. Perhaps we might even think about the weapons that are carried, the, the rifle, the rucksack, the Kevlar helmet, or flak vest. And all those things are pertinent. But one thing that we don't ever really think about, our minds don't necessarily draw to that, is footwear. It's just a given. Footwear is an afterthought. Yet footwear is one of the absolute most important items of the uniform apparel. You see, a soldier's feet are very important to him. They are very important and vital to the body to keep safe. And for this cause, we have the shoes or proper shoes, which are a valuable asset to the soldier in his uniform. I know from experience that proper fitting shoes, proper fitting boots can make or break a soldier in the field of battle. Stability, sure-footedness in the heat of battle is key. Warfare is carried out in a multiplicity of terrains, rocky, jagged edges in mountain warfare, hard, hard pavement in urban territory, sand, grass, water, not to mention the insects and the animals that make their terrain their home, some of which being the most, in, the most poisonous or, or venomous in the world. And so it's treacherous, it's dangerous, it's dirty, and it's unforgiving, and it certainly isn't something that one would care to undertake unprotected or unprepared. And so the apostle was very, very intricate in his illustration. Paul was very determinate and very intentional in what he describes. You see, in Paul's day, many soldiers wore sandals. Now, everybody wore sandals then. Everybody had on a pair of sandals if they weren't barefooted. Everybody wore that type of footwear, but the soldier's footwear was, was very important to him because it was made for him. It was made for battle. And so everybody wore that, but the soldiers wore a different type of footwear. The soldiers wore a sandal that was made out of leather, and it would often lace around the ankle and maybe even part way up the calf, causing that to be stable and secure. Interestingly, and you probably know this, but the sandals which the soldiers in Rome wore then were often fitted with spikes on the bottom of the sole. And so like soldiers in modern warfare, these men, they carried out their battle in all sorts of terrain, in all sorts of weather, in all hours of the day, and then, maybe not so much now, but then hand-to-hand -hand combat was the means by which battles were decided. And often the armor's effectiveness became the deciding factor. Hear me now. For example, just picture with me for a moment. Picture fighting in grass with the heat of battle ensuing. There's weapons flying everywhere. The grass is wet with the morning dew or maybe saturated from a recent rain. Or maybe, even as grotesque as it may sound, it's slick with blood from the fallen soldiers around you. It was those spikes. It was those accoutrements to those sandals. The bottom of them that helped them make maintain their footing that may have kept them alive in the heat of battle. Can I say it like this? It helped them. It aided them. It caused them to have the ability to stand firm in the battle. It's no wonder that Paul said in Ephesians 6 and 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore your feet 
shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And so spiritually speaking, our battleground here right now, right now where we are, our theater of war is carried out, it's already been said, in a fallen unmistakably treacherous world and if we are going to be a soldier in this army we must hear me I'm going somewhere we must stand firm in the battle if we are going to do anything for God we must stand firm in the battle we must be able to stand We must be able to stand with the ability to withstand the constancy of the relentless attacks of our enemy. To stand and withstand the constant, hear me now, the changes in our societal norms that seem to change with every sunrise. The relentless attack of your faith. The winds of doctrine that blow in every single direction. The ebbs and the flows and the ideals and the ideologies, the ever-changing opinions and the concepts that are forever evolving and tempting to get you to retreat. You must, we must, I must stand firm. Paul said if you're going to do this, if you're going to accomplish it, there's only one way that you're going to be able to do it. Having done all to stand, stand therefore, having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. That word shod means to bind, to bind under one's feet, to stand, to stand firm with what you have, to put on shoes, to put on the sandals, to put them on your Self. And so if we are going to stand, Paul said we have a solution. If we're going to stand, Paul said we have an effective piece of spiritual armor. And it is the peace, the peace of God. I'm thankful tonight that it's his peace. <laughs> I'm thankful we're not standing on my peace. <laughs> I'm thankful that we're not standing, and I mean all respect to you. I'm, I'm thankful we're not standing on your peace here tonight, but we're standing on His peace. It's His peace. It's His peace. Can we get that for a moment? It's His peace. It's not mine. It doesn't necessarily belong to me. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but it really doesn't matter what comes along because He's not taking a back bite. It's His peace. And it is tied directly to what's already been outlined and will be in the coming weeks by the Apostle Paul. The girdle of truth, it stands. The girdle of truth ties everything together. It secures. You can stand on truth. Truth is truth all by itself. It doesn't need any help. It doesn't need to be propped up. In fact, it helps us to stand. And it goes right in line with the breastplate of righteousness, the unrighteousness of this world that would attempt to to, to, to discredit and to take us out of the battle. We are protected by that breastplate of righteousness and we stand firm on the peace of God. That's why, not to get too far ahead of myself, but that's why it's called, that's why Paul said it's called the gospel of peace. I've already said it. It's not my peace. It's not your peace. It's his peace. That's the good news. We don't have to worry about what peace. We don't have to worry if we can find it. It's his peace. But it only becomes effective when we put it on. It only becomes effective when we dawn it. So how do we do just that? I'm glad you asked. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You want to know how to put it on? Just repent. Just be baptized in his name. Because Galatians said in 3 and 27 For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, Romans 5 and 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with 
God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have his peace because if we have his peace, we have the knowledge that we have obeyed his word. In fact, that is the peace. Knowing, knowing that we have obeyed the word of God. That is the peace that will ensure my stability and my ultimate survival. Knowing, hear me now, that we have put on Christ, that we have obeyed the gospel, produces the ability to withstand whatever comes our way. Well, am I the only one that believes that here tonight? I know there's a lot of things that can come against us, but knowing that we have made our peace call and election sure, we can stand on his word, and we know his word is forever settled in heaven, and we know that by obeying his word, we can stand on that because we are prepared. We are prepared. See, to navigate to safely walk through, to safely walk over and around the myriad of pitfalls that accompany the landscape in which we walk, we must have on the peace, the covering of God. And in order to have that covering, we must prepare for that peace. I know what it's like to be unprepared. That's not, that's not the case tonight. <laughs> Smile at me for a moment. I'm prepared tonight, but I know what it's like to be unprepared. It's anything but peaceful. Unpreparedness is anything but peaceful. It produces confusion and chaos. And hear me now, confusion can ultimately lead to death. Physically, most certainly spiritually. There is nothing that has taken more lives tragically than unprepared and complacency. When the tragedy strikes or the calamity befalls, unpreparedness will put us in a place or in a position that has the inability to react properly. And so by that time, whatever it is, is simply too late. But we know that God is not the author of confusion. But he is the author of peace. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. And God wants us to be prepared. Case in point. The book of Exodus. The children of Israel were instructed to be dressed and ready. They ate the Passover clothed with their shoes, the Bible says, on their feet and their staff in their hand. I'm going to drive this home. They were ready. They ate the Passover clothed fully with their shoes on their feet and their staff in their hand. God gave them intricate instructions on how to prepare for the passing over of the death angel. The Lord gave them explicit direction as to how to obtain the ability to escape the coming judgment over the nation of Israel. The Lord, time and time again, had plagued Egypt over and over. The hardness of Pharaoh's heart continued to draw harder and harder. And the Lord sent judgment after judgment after judgment upon that nation. Now up to this point, Israel had been somewhat removed from the situation. The Bible says the land of Goshen was separated and otherwise out of harm's way during all of this. But the final judgment, the final judgment upon Egypt would include now all. The final judgment would now include everyone in the building, so to speak, unless the remedy was applied and the remedy was given. Exodus 12 and 21, the Mo then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is, on, that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth 
the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts the Lord will pass over and he will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. I'm going on and you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever and it shall come to pass when you shall come to the land which the Lord shall give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you what mean ye by this service that ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed and heard and worshipped hear me now no stone not one, not one question, not one stone was left unturned. There was no guessing game played at the dinner table that night as to whether or not they were prepared. No, that man heard from Moses. That man stood under the sound of his voice and he heard the instruction for the Lord. And he took that word and he carried it home and he did expressly and intently what God had told them to do. He prepared his house. He prepared his family. He applied it. It was done. And it was done according to the word of God. How can I apply this to where we are tonight well I'll tell you there is coming a day when the eastern sky of this earth will roll open like a scroll and the Lord will come with a host of an angel army hear me the probability and the likelihood of that happening or occurring in this generation is higher than it ever has been in recent generations the telltale signs they're among us you can look around and see that they are clearer than they ever have been and the words that Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 have always been relevant to every generation that have read them yet they carry now an added focus of clarity and similarity to the world around us more so today than any generation that precedes us Jesus is coming and we better get ready ready. Jesus is coming just like he said and we must be prepared. And there is no one more privier to that than the enemy that we face. There is no one more believing to that than the enemy that we face. He stood on a mountain with him. He tried to get him to bow and worship. He tried to give him this earth. And he said, no, I don't want this. I'm coming after a church. I'm going to die on a hill for a church. I'm going to shed my blood for people, not for things. And I am going to do what I said I was going to do. And so he knows. He knows that that's going to occur. He understands and he is ready for it to occur. Hear me now, I'm not giving him more credence than he is deserving of. He's not all powerful, but he does know a lot of things. He's not all powerful, but he is formidable. He's not all knowing, but he's got a lot of head knowledge. He, 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 he's displayed that throughout scripture. And hear me, he is not playing. He is warring for our souls. He is warring for the souls of our children. He is intently warring to destroy families and scatter them abroad and in many cases he's been very successful in doing that and so it's guaranteed he's prepared for battle. It's guaranteed he's already been, he's been doing push ups waiting for you to be born. He already, he already got here he's already been locked and loaded and he came here looking for a fight He's got a hand load of accusations and he's got well stocked, well proven centuries upon centuries snares that are already in place. So I don't give him any more than that. He doesn't know everything. He knows a lot. And so if I am going to win the battle, if I am going to win the ground that I defend, I must be prepared. In his plea to lawmakers and influential American state and national leaders to prepare for war, General George Washington was quoted in writing the following. He said, the king will push the war as long as the nation will find men or money. 
let us prepare for the worst because there is nothing which will so soon produce peace as a state of preparation for war. There is absolutely nothing that will so soon produce peace than being ready, than being absolutely prepared. And so that is why the Apostle Paul admonished his listeners to equip their feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What Paul was saying then, and he still rings saying tonight, here tonight, is that preparation produces peace, which should accompany us into battle. It produces the actively being prepared The peace of God produces peace in us by donning the complete armor of God. Simply stated, Paul said, get ready. Get prepared. Prepare for battle. Equip, be equipped all times for war. Ready for whatever will inevitably come. He said, equip yourselves with his peace. There's good news. It's not your peace, and it's not my peace. It's his peace. There's a gospel to this. It's good news. You've been given this. You can put this on, and it will help you. And with his peace, when my faith is tried, and everything is coming at me in all different directions, I can stand. When my world seems to be confused and my my world seems to be full of chaos and it attempts to rob me of my faculties, I can stand on his peace with his peace. When the winds of adversity blow, I can stand secure, prepped, and ready. The shoes of peace, the shoes of the gospel, not only are made for standing, but they're made for walking. They're not only made to stand firm, but they're made to carry. I'm going to tell you tonight that the peace of God can carry you. Oh, yes, it can. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what might come your way because not everything is the adversary. We're done giving him all the credence that he's going to get tonight. Sometimes there's just life. Sometimes life comes at you at 90 miles an hour, but the peace of God can carry you. Being prepared with God's peace can transition you safely with protection. I'm not ashamed to tell you tonight that I am tender-footed. I don't like to go out of the house without shoes on. I don't want to walk in the cool grass and feel the sand between my toes. No, I want shoes on my feet no matter where I'm going. If I'm going off the carpet, I want shoes on my feet. If I'm going out the door, I've got to put shoes on my feet because I need to be protected. I need to feel that sure foundation under me. Psalm 91 and 7 said, Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. And so that means that we We can trample on them, but it also means that they're going to be present in this life. And so if we're going to be walking on stuff like that, give me a pair of shoes. I want them to go up to my hips. I want to make sure that I'm protected. I want to make sure that my feet are shod with a barrier between my foot and the ground. That's what gives me the confidence. That's what helps me step sure with shoes on my feet to protect me, to aid me in unhindered travel. The peace of God can protect. The peace of God can cover and it can aid us in the safe travel through this uncharted world. It's not always a warm and fuzzy feeling, but it's a sure foundation. Because the fact of the matter is this. We are not only fighting for ourselves. So we're going to switch gears just here for a moment. It's not always warm and fuzzy. In fact, most of the time it's not. Battle isn't fun. People that say they're ready to go to war, there's something wrong with them. I've been around some guys like that. They'll scare you. Battle is not fun. Because your responsibility is not just for yourself. You've got soldiers on your left and soldiers on your right. And you got a nation at home waiting to see what you're going to do. Paul called it the gospel of peace. It's good news. 
It's news that is to be carried. It's good news that is meant to be taken and published abroad. The peace is for us. The sure foundation upon which we stand is for us, but it's also for them. And we must carry it to them. Mark 16 and 15, Jesus. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And so the Great Commission... Is not just a mission, it is a co-mission that is predicated upon preaching. Belief and obedience to the word of God begins at the transportation of the gospel. In the book of Ephesians we read 6 and 15, Paul said, To shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Paul here refers to, or at least alludes to, Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52 and 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Paul references Isaiah 52 and seven, where the prophet envisioned Jehovah's messengers bringing tidings of true peace. For Paul, this true peace stabilized the Christian, prepared him for a spiritual battle, and equipped him with a voice to be an effective messenger of the good news. Now, it's important to note that in its immediate context, Isaiah 52 and 7 Describes a herald who announces Jerusalem is saved. But Paul then expands this idea in Romans 10 and 15 to describe preachers of the gospel. The salvation God gave to the exiles that were returning to a restored life in Jerusalem was now extended to those who hear the gospel and obey. Romans 10 and 14, he asks the question, how then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And there's one more. And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And so the commission, the commission, is predicated upon the preaching of the gospel. And Paul said that you ought to carry it with you everywhere you go. I'll close with this if our musicians will come. And I'll be closing quickly. Was it very long ago that we went to Ocala and please pardon the personal illustration I, I don't love to do that but I feel like it's pertinent we were in Ocala and we were staying in a hotel and, and we stayed the night we woke up the next day and we had made our way down to the lobby to eat breakfast and as we were getting our food I, I'm, I'm sort of made eye contact with a lady at a table, and as it was, as it turned out, we ended up sitting next, next to them. It was a lady and a gentleman. We made eye contact, and we ex exchanged pleasantries. We, you know, the normal good morning, how are you, those sort of things. I don't know her; she doesn't know us. 
just pleasantries. But as we sat and ate, she kept kind of looking over ever so often. She made eye contact with Kaylin and she waved at Kaylin and she made a comment about how pretty she was and we said thank you. And the conversation just sort of kind of meandered along and, and got more in depth. Where are you from? We're from Florida. She was from the Northeast, far, far from Florida. She said, we're here just visiting family, some friends. We just wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle, the rat race of life. We're just down here visiting them. We stayed here, and we're going to go meet them now. We're just sort of kind of relaxing, pleasantries. Well, that's neat. That's good. And we went on about our business. We ate. We were done. They got done. They stood up to leave. And I don't know why, but we just made eye contact again. I'm sitting, she's standing. And she said, can I ask you a question? And we began to talk about church. Why are you here? Well, we're here for a conference. We're here for church service. In fact, we're going there later on this, this morning. She began to talk about why they were there in more depth. She said that they were there really and truly to just try to get away from the things that were going on. She began to talk about her son. She divulged to us that he had become addicted to all manner of things, drugs and alcohol. And at that moment, she had no idea where he was. He had left. He had run off. She didn't know if he was alive or dead. She didn't know when he was coming home or even if he would come home. And she said, when you pray, can you pray for my son? And I'm not trying to be anything. I'm not saying I am anything. But I felt right then. I said, no, ma'am, we're going to pray right now. We're going to pray for him right now. And I just told her, I said, I don't know him. I don't know you. I don't know where he is, and neither do you. But God knows exactly where he is. And we prayed, and there wasn't lightning bolts. There wasn't some sort of angelic host that showed up. But I'm going to tell you what we could feel when we prayed. We felt the peace of God. I believe that she was in search of that peace. And I am so glad. Not because of who I am. Not because of who Amy is. But I am so thankful that I put on that peace a long time ago. And we were able to intersect. Now, I don't know what happened to him, and I don't know what happened to her, and pro probably that's by design. But I believe that there is a world that is in need of preachers of the gospel of peace, not by standing behind a, bull, a pulpit or a desk necessarily, but people who will wake up every day and put that peace on every day that will put that peace on and carry it wherever they go because we're fighting for them. We are fighting for them. And here's the sad part, and I don't mean to bring this down, but here's the scary part, is if we could put it on, it stands a reason that we can take it off. Paul said, put on the whole armor. Put on those shoes. And so I'll end how I began. We live in tumultuous times. We're surrounded by chaos and calamity. We're living in unpredictability. And quite frankly, not everything is going to go our way. Not everything is going to be agreeable. We've already walked through those waters before and not everything is going to be in our favor. But we don't fight fire with fire. We don't fight injustice with anarchy and angst because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But Paul said they're mighty and they're mighty through God 
to the pulling down of strongholds in our lives and in the lives of others. And so we have all we need. All we need to do is put it on. We have all we need. All we have to do is don it and carry it and do and be what God has called us to. To be, And so I just ask you tonight, are you ready to put it on? Can we stand in this altar tonight or make an altar where you stand and put it on and proclaim to this world that there is peace to be found and that there is peace to be had and that there is peace to be eternally enjoyed in Jesus' name. Come on, let's.